welcoming you all to this uh, session, which is the first open lecture for the Pulitzer Prize Winners Workshop organized by the Hong Kong Baptist University. Uh, this is the fourth time that we are organizing this kind of workshop. Uh, as you all know, every year since four years ago, we've been inviting uh, uh, winners of the Pulitzer Prize uh, to come to Hong Kong to share their experiences with us. So this year, uh, as usual, we are very happy to have invited, uh, I think, a number of speakers, uh, I think almost 10, right? And uh, this first open lecture, uh, there will be two speakers. Um, now, uh, we have this venue until about noon. So what we're going to do is to invite the speaker to come here to speak um, for about 30 to 45 minutes, and then there will be a question and answer session, and then we'll move on to the second speaker, and then there will be a question and answer session. So let me introduce the, the first speaker, uh, who is Professor Jackie Banasinski. Now some of you might have already looked at his, uh, her bio on the web, but let me just briefly introduce her. Um, Professor Benesinski uh, worked at the uh, St. Paul Pioneer Press in the 80s. Um, in 1988, he, she won the Pulitzer Prize uh, Award in feature writing for a series on AIDS. Now, AIDS um, is now, uh, I think, a familiar disease to many of you, but actually in the 80s, it was still something that was pretty new. Um, what Professor Menesinski uh, did was to uh, profile the uh, experiences of a gay couple in rural Minnesota uh, to uh, chronicle how AIDS had affected them and their life. Um, Professor Menesinski is now teaching at the uh, Missouri School of Journalism, and she is also a fellow at the Pointer Institute. So without further ado, uh, let me invite Professor Benesinski. Yeah. Okay, hi everyone. Hi. Uh, first rule of business, are your cell phones turned off or on to vibrate so I don't have to try to interpret your ringtones? I'm always, I'm always like thrilled to hear about ringtones, but um, I've got to figure out how I'm going to do this here. Um, thanks for coming. Um, what I want to do with you a little bit today is talk about some history, not a lot of history because your world is more about the future than it is the past. Um, but I want to start by having you uh, imagine a scenario. It was 20 years ago and I was a reporter working in Antarctica. I was covering, believe it or not, a dog sled expedition across Antarctica. Now, just so you don't think I'm completely crazy, I didn't go all the way across Antarctica with the dog sledders, but I started with them at the beginning, and then I flew in and met them in the middle, and then I met them at the end. And it was a big international um, exploration event, and there was actually a, a Chinese man, a Chinese scientist, Chin Daho, who was with them at the time. Chin was an interesting guy because the dog sled expedition basically had three, three sleds carrying all this gear. They went all the way across Antarctica the long way on foot, and the men skied. And Chin Daho, before he got asked to join the expedition, had never been cross-country skiing in his life. So he basically learned on the job. He's a wonderful man. Anyway, I was covering this uh, expedition, and when the expedition was getting started, I needed to file stories back to my newspaper in Minnesota. <clears throat> and we had been staying at the Chinese science station but once the expedition la launched, the Chinese uh, scientists at the science station said we couldn't stay there anymore. There were a couple of journalists and there were some dog handlers from the expedition. So we were basically kicked out. We had no place to stay. We were waiting for the plane that was going to take us back to South America. And the weather got really bad and the plane couldn't fly very well. It was one of these really, really small planes. So we were just sitting and sitting. And we had literally no place to go. So we were sitting in a warehouse that was kind of a hangar for the airplanes and I had to file a story so I remember sitting on a crate it was fairly warm in Antarctica at the time it was probably only about 10 or 20 below freezing uh, below zero uh, Fahrenheit I don't know how to translate that into Celsius but you can do that um, and I was sitting on a crate and I had a notebook with me and I cut the fingers off of my mittens and I had a pencil because one of the things you learn is that ballpoint ink pens freeze in the cold. So when you do cold weather journalism, you learn things like 
you take a pencil. So I had a pencil, and I wrote my story out in block printing by hand, and it was about a 60 or 70 inch story, so about 2,500 word story. And I block printed the entire thing out, I tore it out of my notebook, and then I went to somebody in the Chinese station, and I paid them $50 to fax my story back to my newsroom. But because we couldn't rely on the phone lines and the fax, I also made sure that I took it on the airplane with me, and when we, the airplane finally took off and we flew back to Chile, where we were staying, I could fax it from there. Now, that was 20 years ago. No cell phones. We had computers, but you couldn't have used one in Antarctica anyway because there was no place to plug in. The only way you could get a phone call out of Antarctica was if you had one of these big sat phones. They're about this big, huge things. And then only if you were in an area where there was a satellite signal, which was very iffy. That was just 20 years ago. Now, I tell you this story because I want you to think about how much things have changed. I was in newsrooms for 30 years, and we constantly felt like things were changing all the time, like we were assaulted with change. Um, when I first started, we were still using manual typewriters. Then we got electric typewriters with something called scanner copy. And we would type our copy and we'd send them through these funny tubes, uh, these pneumatic tubes, and they'd go over to the copy desk. We finally got ATEX computers, which were dumb computers. We had no access to the internet. The internet didn't exist yet. Graphics came on board when I was still a reporter. We never had infographics when I started out. It was just pictures and words. That's all we did. And it felt things are constantly, constantly changing. But the truth is, very little changed during that time. And the newspapers that I worked for in 1975 were not much different, really, than the newspapers I was working for in the year 2005. Now, I want to pause for a second. Several years ago, I heard somebody give a talk. And it was indeed, it was about newspaper change. And we thought we were in the middle of a lot of change. And this person gave a talk in which she said that in um, the last 100 years, 150 years in human history, more has changed than had changed in all of human history before that. And at first that didn't make sense to me, but when you stop and think about it, until the invention of the combustion engine, human beings still got around exactly the same way they always did, on foot, by horse, and by water. It still took forever to get from one side of the United States to the other until the car and the railroad were invented. Since that time, think about the changes. In your lifetime, you are exposed to things that didn't exist when I was born. My mother was born in an era before rocket ships. My mother never flew on an airplane. Now we've got medicines that heal us. We've got laser surgery to take care of our eyes if they don't work. We've got rocket ships going everywhere. We've got nanotechnology. They're planting little chips in our necks so we can get through security at airports. God knows what else is going to happen tomorrow. So things are changing at lightning speed. The same now is true of journalism. That wasn't true five years ago. Five years ago, we were still holding on to the way we had always done things. There are huge implications for this change, and your generation is going to have to figure them out. <clears throat> Some of the other things I was remembering while I uh, was getting ready to speak with you that I just want to mention, because I think it is interesting to know how people did this work not that long ago. Um, a year after I was in Antarctica, for the story I told you about, I went to Iraq right after the first Persian Gulf War. And the U.S. had pulled its ground troops out of Iraq, um, so the ground war officially was over. But um, Saddam Hussein's army had taken the Kurdish people and pushed them north out of their homeland, or what passed for their homeland, the Kurds have never really had a homeland, into refugee camps in Turkey and Iran and Syria. The photographer and I flew over and um, ended up spending three weeks in the mountains and in the refugee camps with the, uh, the Iraqi Kurds. And there was only one hotel to stay in, we were in far, far eastern Turkey, and the only hotel to stay in was about seven hours from the mountains. So we'd stay in this hotel, and we'd get in a jeep in the morning, and we'd drive to the border of Iraq. We would hitchhike across the Tigris River, and then we'd walk into um, a small city where the UN was establishing a safe zone for returning refugees and trying to clean up the hospitals and things like that. Everybody who was in the press was staying at that same hotel because it was the only place to stay. And I remember being out in the mountains one night, or one day, getting our story, and I had to go back and file. 
And back then we had something called, I don't know if any of you have ever seen these. Um, there were these little dumb computers, basically an electronic typing machine. And when you opened them up, they had a screen and you could see about seven lines of type. And um, you type your story and then you had a set of what were called muffs. And they were these big like earphone type things that you would put into the ends of a, of a standard telephone and you would dial the telephone and hit a button and your story would get sent over this telephone line. And so you had to get to a telephone, right? So I get back to the hotel and there's one pay telephone in the hotel and we all have to use it. I learned a big lesson when I was there because there was a reporter for the New York Times who had paid someone to stay on the phone all the time so no one else could use it. <laughs> So he literally had a paid person who was on the phone, the, the pay phone. And I went up to him and I said, can you share the phone? He said, absolutely not. Are you crazy? <laughs> so I had to figure out what to do. So I walked down the street and I knocked on the door of the local um, post office and telegraph office. And I gave the people $50. And I said, would you let me sit inside your post office tonight? Because they had a phone. <laughs> and so I sat on a crate, typed my story, and sent it over the phone line. And I did that every night for three weeks because the New York Times had the one pay phone. Joint. Can you imagine working that way now? Can you imagine doing reporting without a cell phone? Can you imagine doing a report, reporting without Google? <laughs> yeah, that really scares my students when I say, no Google on this one. You actually have to call somebody up. And they're like, well, I have to find them first on Google, right? <laughs> um, I have a student who literally had never used a phone book. So I picked up the phone book one day and I whacked him on the head with the phone book. And I said, this was the first Google. You learn how to use it. It, things have changed dramatically, and I want to talk to you a little bit about the implications for that. One last funny little story about cell phones. I worked, my last newspaper was the Seattle Times. Seattle Times just won the award in the United States for the in, most innovative newspaper of the year. Ten years ago, I was an editor in Seattle, and a colleague of mine and I were fighting with management to allow us to get cell phones for the reporting staff. We did not have cell phones for the staff. This was in 1999. There was a big uh, demonstration and um, street ride in Seattle based on the World Trade Organization, the WTO. I think a lot of you are probably familiar with the WTO because it's been a big issue in China's development as an economy and, and uh, into the emerging de democratic world. And we didn't have any cell phones, and so our reporters were caught in the middle of the street riot, and they had no way to talk to each other because we didn't have phones. And so we finally got cell phones in time for, for Y2K, for the, the, uh, the change in the millennial. We didn't have cell phones 10 years ago in the newsroom. Imagine doing your job that way. So you're now being thrust into a world where things are changing much, much more rapidly than they even did in my time. And in the last three years, the changes we've seen have been profound. <clears throat> They've been troubling in some ways because they are challenging um, not only the way we always did journalism, but they're challenging the ethical foundations of our journalism. What we thought were professional boundaries are being run over by some technological advances and some changes. Those things are going to have to be sorted out. Um, there will probably be talk this week about the business model um, of Western journalism failing. Uh, once Google and Craigslist came into being, the way we've always made money has gone away and we have to figure that out. We haven't sorted that out yet. I've never made money in my life, so I'm not going to solve that problem for you. I'm going to focus on the journalism. Uh, but I want to talk to you about some of that. So um, first I want to show you, to reinforce this notion of um, how much papers didn't change, this, these next three slides are the Seattle Times uh, within the last five, four or five years. Pretty traditional paper, right? And that's what we did every day. We, we finally, I think, got, and after we got cell phones in 2000, we built an online operation probably in around 2003, 2004, so 10 full years after the internet. But it was pretty separate from the news operation. And what we were doing was posting stories, um, big breaking stories as they happened, but only if they were huge stories. And otherwise, we would post maybe three times a day. So. As opposed to the internet, which is this very fluid, organic thing that wants information when information happens, we had a clock, which means we were still running on an old production model, saying, well, let's post at noon, at 6 p.m., and at midnight. We were holding stories because we didn't want our competition to see them. So we were, with, we were still withholding information from the internet. Still a very old-fashioned reporting model. 
Now I want to show you a little video clip from the Seattle Times today, five years later. Welcome to Seattle, where we're changing the news equation. What we want to do is not to be seen as, as being a dinosaur living behind an iron curtain or a brick wall. We want to be seen as, yes, we still have the traditional values that have made us so strong, and we're not, we're not willing to compromise on those, um, but we are willing to accept that the world's changing and that technology offers us opportunity every bit as much as it offers a, a threat. Here in Seattle, that means we've harnessed our community and our one-time competitors to amplify our journalism. We now invite readers not only to talk about our stories, but to help us cover and distribute them via Twitter and Facebook, Dippity and Google Wave. We've also forged partnerships with hyperlocal sites. That helps us reach new readers and offer existing ones stories that we no longer have the staff to cover. It's news to the third power. Here's how that approach played out last November when a lone gunman walked into a coffee shop near Tacoma and assassinated four police officers. I look at my phone and I see the breaking news. I saw what happened. Immediately dial into the newsroom, figure out what's going on. We create a hashtag, wash shooting hashtag. There hadn't been one created yet and people immediately started using it and it was going gangbusters. Jennifer Sullivan had gotten the suspect's name early on. My guess is that we probably had at least a four to five hour jump on every other news organization. And within that time, we were able to build a really compelling profile of Maurice Clements, not only who he was, but how he came to be free on that day. We were investigating on the run and we were innovating on the run. As soon as we confirmed information, we pushed it out on every platform we had and some we had only read about up till then to help a frightened community make sense of what was happening. On Monday, it just kind of hit me, we'll just use Google Wave, we'll just try it. It kind of got bogged down when we had close to 500 people on the actual Wave, but it was like email, chat room, wiki, but with rich media capabilities so you can collaborate on a map together in real time. So Diffity is just one of those tools where you can organize things and in a timeline format video, photo, text, and it creates some kind of chronological narrative, which was useful here because we're talking about a 40-hour manhunt and people want to know as things are changing. I was proud of our team and how we work together and how um, the photography and multimedia and with the web and print, we broke, we did our jobs, but we also, I think we broke some new ground. Our reporting online and in print won the Pulitzer Prize for coverage of breaking news but as every journalist knows, it's not the response to the big story that's the true test of a newsroom. It's how we handle the day-to-day -day challenges. In the last 12 months, we have formed news partnerships with nearly 30 hyperlocal news sites. Most cover neighborhoods, but some focus on topics of particular interest to Seattle readers, such as bicycling, sailing, and beer. This cooperative has allowed us to provide news for our readers that we no longer have the staff to cover on our own. And because we're partnering only with sites that share our journalism values, we minimize the risk and maximize the value of all of the participating news sites, including our own. Because of the way the Times has chosen to conduct this, rather than taking our content and rewrapping it as if they're sort of trying to pretend that it's something that's being produced specifically for the Times, it'll be a link off the homepage directly to one of our stories. But the end result, at least for seattletimes.com readers, is still that you look at seattletimes.com's homepage and there is a broader kind of coverage. In August, we published our most ambitious collaborative project. Our newsroom produced a package of stories on the growth of family homelessness and the system's ability to address it. Then seven of our partners brought that reporting home by writing about problems and programs in their backyards. I didn't intend for none of this to happen. I really feel bad because I've never had to ask anyone for anything. I've always worked and had my own. We're not saying we found all the answers, but forging community partnerships and embracing our readers has multiplied our reach and our relevance. Even more important, it's proof to our critics that this dinosaur is alive and kicking and embracing evolution.
Okay, I'm going to have you all do a little work. Your students, you're supposed to do that. Um, in that clip you saw, how many different kind of innovative or new practices did you hear? Just name some of them. What did you hear that people are doing that's different than what I talked to you about how I work? Tease them out. Okay. Mobile phones, not only to call back to the newsroom and report a story or to interview someone, but literally to share information and update a story. Facebook and social media, using them as reporting tools and as publishing tools. What else did you hear? Google Wave. Google Wave, right. How many people in here use Google Wave? I tried it one time. I couldn't figure it out. It made me dizzy. Um, but they're actually using it now as a reporting tool and they're jumping in, which means they're open sourcing the news. They're letting people jump in and say, I heard this, I saw this. And that's an interesting thing to do because we always controlled as the gatekeepers that information and we never let it out until we had thoroughly vetted it. And now the world is jumping in and helping us report that news. Did you hear anything else? Wiki? Did somebody say Wiki? Yeah. yeah, and we're going to talk about Wiki a little bit further because Wiki's got some interesting implications. And Google Wave, as I understand it, is sort of a Wiki type thing, right? What else did you hear? You talked about partnerships. Twitter, very much. Twitter is huge. Matter of fact, I'm going to stop and I'll tell you this story now. One of the ways that the Seattle Times covered that manhunt for the for the man who shot the police. The backstory is there was a guy who had been in jail in, I think, Arkansas, in prison. He was let out on parole. Uh, the governor actually signed a release letting him out. He ends up in Washington State where he has family. He gets in trouble again. He ends up in jail. They let him out again over the weekend on bond. Nobody checks his history. He's told a bunch of people he's going to kill some cops. And he walks into a bakery, a coffee shop one morning, and he literally assassinates four policemen, three men and a woman. And so there was this huge manhunt for him. Seattle Times did two things that were interesting. They did all of their old traditional kind of reporting. They got the name of the, sus the suspect through old gumshoe reporting. Two reporters who had great contacts and great sources within the police department got the names on the QT from the police. So they weren't using Google. They were on the phone working sources who trusted them saying we have to have a name and cutting a deal with the police about how they would use that name. At the same time, they were using their strong knowledge of how to do database reporting to find out once they got the name what this guy's history was. And the third thing they were doing, as they said, is they were innovating on the fly. They were saying what tools do we have because this thing is moving really fast. One of the things they did they had a reporter, veteran reporter, and a photo intern. Not the young woman you saw up here, but a guy, a young guy who was a photography in intern. And they were out in the streets in the middle of the night, cha you know, following the manhunt. And they ended up walking themselves into a neighborhood that the police soon got to and surrounded. So now the reporter and the photographer are inside the search zone. They knock on a door and they ask a guy if they can come and use his house as a staging area. Police can't tell a private citizen no, and besides things were moving so fast, the police weren't paying attention. So the reporter and the photographer get into this house, and the photographer gets up onto a second floor balcony in this house where he can see the entire street and he can see the manhunt play out. Now, it was pitch dark because the police had all the lights turned off and they were using night goggles, so they had an advantage over the, uh, the suspect. But what the photographer did, and you can probably tell me if this works, he would hold his camera up and he would take a small picture and it worked like an infrared so it would sort of light up the area right for a brief amount of time so he could see what's going on which means in these little flashes he's watching the manhunt play out no phone didn't know what to do so he pulls out his cell phone and he starts twittering back to the newsroom about what he's seeing on the streets the newsroom sees it and they say they have a little discussion about what they ought to do, and they open up his Twitter, and they sent, start sending his Twitter feeds directly to the public. So now the public is literally following the manhunt while this photographer is seeing it in these little snapshots through his camera and Twittering it on his smartphone. Can you imagine? 
Um, so a whole different kind of reporting. I want to I want to highlight five areas that I think are changing dramatically. There is no way, frankly, I can tell you about everything that's changing uh, on the media landscape. Things we didn't know about yesterday are suddenly going to be in play tomorrow. I want to tell you about five things that are major changes to pay attention to, and I want to encourage you to constantly be thinking about your own. Um, I'm going to move out of the way here about your own need to stay up with these things and not be overwhelmed about, by them. Because frankly, you could spend all your time keeping up with what's going on in the media and never do any journalism. So don't get too lost there. But here we go. Uh, the rise of social media, does this work? The rise of social media, huge, both reporting and publishing on social media. Um, I told you about the Seattle Times uh, Twitter coverage. We're seeing that more and more where newspapers are using Twitter both as a reporting device. They're actually creating groups within Twitter that they follow. So one of the things smart journalists are doing as beat development is following groups of people or specialty people through their Twitter feeds to pick up on news. They are sending notes to each other. Uh, the editor of the paper that we run in Missouri the other day sent a note from his car on his way into work saying there's a major traffic jam can we put something online so people commuting know to avoid this area? Small example, but imagine if somebody had done that before that 10-day traffic jam in uh, Beijing. I would love to know what people in Beijing were doing on their cell phones during those 10 days because they were communicating, and they were communicating through mobile devices because they couldn't get a newspaper and they couldn't turn on a television. Um, the Virginia Tech shootings, I don't know if you guys remember those, are about three years ago when a young man um, went through campus at Virginia Tech over the course of three hours and ended up killing a couple of dozen people. One of the things that was notable about that shooting was it taught the press how to use social media, Twitter and Facebook, because they failed to do it adequately in that case. If the campus had set out an alert to students earlier in the day, they probably would have saved several lives. And so now on campuses across the country, students are asked to give their accounts and universities have policies now where they'll send out feeds on your mobile devices about emergencies and things. I wanted to mention The Guardian in the UK. If there's one paper and one paper only that you follow to see what they're doing in this world, make it The Guardian. They're probably the sharpest and most innovative paper going today in terms of using new media and um, social media. One of the things they did recently was they got a like 40,000 or something pages of documents from the government about a, a change in tax policy that the British government was putting into place. Very controversial. Affects everyone, right, your taxes. The Guardian got a hold of this and they said we can't possibly figure out how to go through this fast enough to write a story about it that will help people make a decision about how to vote on this tax policy. So they dumped it online they literally dumped the tax documents online and they invited their readers to go through it and help them report it out. And the next thing you know, they had accountants and tax attorneys and people filing through these documents, identifying issues and problems and sending them back to The Guardian. Again, it's a type of open source reporting that we didn't see. Storify, I wanted to mention, see if some of, some of these links aren't gonna open. I didn't realize I can't open social media sites through this, through this system here. Um, they're blocked. Storify is something I just ran across literally two days ago. It's a new software that will take all of your Twitter feeds. Let's say you're covering that manhunt on Twitter or you're covering court trials. Court trials are now very, very popular Twitter things. You can plug those in things into Storify and they will reorganize the information and turn it into an actual story for you. Because as you know, when you're reading Twitter, you're doing it backwards, right? So you get the most recent thing first. This goes in and it reorganizes the information and it's got some kind of artificial intelligence in there that sorts the information and turns it into a chronological narrative for you, which means you can capture your Twitter feeds and turn it into an actual story after the fact. There's something new like this coming across every day. So social media is huge. Um, this is an example of um, something that was plugged into Storify. And you can see what they've done in part 
is they put it in alpha, they put it in chronological order, and they also organize the hashtags for you, so you can follow where things are going. It's helping you use this as a tool to report without making your readers do as much work in terms of following it. Um, publishing on Facebook uh, and other social media is also becoming a brand new trend. Um, I'm not going to be able to open up her site, unfortunately. Uh, but I've been intrigued by this. Connie Schultz is a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist at the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Um, and she's, she's just a really, really good smart reporter who now writes a column. She started about two or three years ago, I'm not sure when, every time a soldier, a U.S. soldier, is killed in Iraq or Afghanistan in our war over there, she pulls the basic press release that we get from the Department of Defense. It's always written exactly the same way. DOD, Department of Defense, announced today the death of a soldier. It gives the soldier's name, where they died, what they died of, and it gives a little bit about his unit and hometown. It's very short, it's the same thing. Now we get those things, press releases in the newsroom, right? And we, we follow up stories if the soldier is from our local area. Well, Connie just decided to pick these things up wholesale and pass them along on her Facebook site. Now, I'm friends with Connie on Facebook, and that means if I'm going through my Facebook site and I'm reading about my friends, you know, what their kids dressed up for as Halloween, and they're writing about the football game, and they're writing about what they're going to have for dinner, and they're writing about some deadline they have on a project, all of a sudden, in the middle of this kind of serendipitous random conversation, I will see that another soldier has died in Afghanistan or Iraq. She makes no judgment about it. She doesn't comment on it. She just puts it there so I have to recognize in the stream of my daily life that this is happening. And she's been doing this for three years without fail. And so every day you open up your Facebook and suddenly you're reading two, three, four, five more names. It's a very, very brilliant way to get a message across and to let the public decide what they want to do with that message. Rise of social media part two, branding and promotion. The journalist as a celebrity or a brand. This is very uncomfortable territory for us. Again, you're not going to be able to open this up. David Carr is a longtime colleague of mine from Minnesota who is the media reporter at the New York Times. David Carr is on Twitter and Facebook all the time sending out little tweets of what's going on. Uh, about eight, ten months ago, a, a mutual friend of ours was killed in an accident, an editor, and we were at the funeral together. <coughs> and after we got out of the funeral, Carr was sitting in the funeral tweeting from the funeral, letting people know who was there because it was of great interest to the journalism community. He also promotes his own columns and his own stories on Facebook and Twitter, and he has basically built himself his own personal brand. So people are following him specifically. So he's using it to build audience and also to promote his um, particular pieces, which means the newspaper is getting more clicks. Because I might not go to the New York Times three times a day, but if Carr shows up on my Facebook account or my Twitter account and he refs to a story I'm interested in, suddenly I'm reading it. Um, Promoting journals, and this is another friend of mine from um, Kiev. He's, a, he's an American who runs an English language daily in Kiev, and he promotes his column on Facebook and Twitter, and as a result, he has a worldwide audience of Ukrainian expats who wouldn't have any idea what he was doing otherwise. Um, this is his newspaper. And what's interesting is one of the things we're seeing as journalists do this is their personality shows through in their Facebook and Twitter feeds. Brian has a real personality, tells me real stories, and the studies show that the public expects that out of social media. They want you to have kind of a, a specific and unique personality. Raises issues because you can't bleed over into opinion or bias if you're not a columnist or an opinion journalist, but you have to have a personality. You have to have a voice. There's Brian's links. Um, I looked at his thing yesterday, his birthday was October 28th, and I had to go through five pages of birthday messages. But this is an example of the kinds of things he's posting, which means he has made his small little newspaper in Ukraine, which the government wants to constantly be putting the kibosh on, he's made it a live active thing, and he's got a very, very rich community who's following him of English speakers not only in Ukraine, but expat Ukrainians or people who have lived and worked there from around the world. So he's getting tips. And he's also showing his boss he has a following. 
So the guy with the money who supports the paper isn't as eager to go away. Um, this is one from a former student of mine who started work as a copy editor in uh, Austin, Texas. And then the paper at one point said, well, we need a food writer. Would you fill in? She has now become one of the top food authorities in Texas. What's interesting about her is that she has a very strong personality online, but she separates what she does from the paper from her personal blogs. She keeps about four or five different blogs. Um, and I was talking to her the other day, and she has a blog called The Feminist Kitchen. She's a young woman who's married, has two kids, considers herself a feminist. The newspaper was uncomfortable with the term feminist. They felt it would turn off some of their more conservative readers. So she has now closed her personal blog. So she has some blogs that are public and some that are private. And she has built a huge, huge brand for herself. And I would expect that this woman is going to go national or international someday, in large part because of how she's using social media to help her reporting. Third component of social media is that notion of private and personal versus public and professional. And you've got to think about this really clearly because, um, I want to read this, go back to that. Um, no, no, go back to the, the, go forward, I'm sorry. No, forward. There we go, okay. Um, this is from also a longtime friend and colleague of mine, a guy named Charles Pierce. He works for the Boston Globe. He's done national reporting for magazines. Uh, he used to, he's a longtime sports reporter. He's on public radio. He's very funny and very bright. Works for Esquire for, I think he works for ESPN and Sports Illustrated sometime. But he also has a very aggressive presence on Facebook. And he's very political. And he wrote this the other day on Facebook. I've heard a couple of times that Stewart, he's referring to John Stewart, calling the president dude is a bad thing that diminishes the office. Has it dawned on any of these maiden ants that there's been a diminishing the office industry in this country since the day he took his hand off the Bible? Jesus, you people. Well, what Charlie is doing here is basically taking a, a shot at the Tea Party folks, the people who are very, very critical of Obama. And I wanted to show you that because Charlie believes that his Facebook and Twitter postings are his personal business. The Boston Globe has asked him to stop. And he's now in a, um, he's in a legal battle with them over whether he has the right to say what he wants on his personal spaces. This has become a huge issue in American newsrooms as reporters use their personal postings for one thing and their professionals for another. And my point of view is when you work for a news organization, you pretty much work for that news organization. And you've got to be aware that anything you put out there can reflect back on the news organization. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a comfortable thing. And nobody can legally tell you in the United States you can't say what you want. But you also don't have to be employed. So if the boss doesn't like it, the boss wins the argument. But the whole personal, private, public, professional is a very important thing to think about. This is another one I told you, the Feminist Kitchen one from Addie, um, the food writer in um, Austin. And this is the site. I'll be interested to see if it's still up. This is the site that she is going to close because of pressure from her bosses. It's a very engaging site and very interesting, but she's just decided she's not willing to let it go because she believes in it and the bosses don't want it affecting their readership, so she's going to take it. She's going to close it, take it private. Oh, you don't have to go through all of these. I think this is an example of her other one, but that's okay. Um, okay, social media, the next thing that's the huge change is the posting of 24-7 news online. Most newsrooms in America are trying now to switch to their digital first, which means they're no longer putting the publication out according to the time the press is run. They're really saying digital first, which means if we have it, it goes up. That's raising huge issues of accuracy and verification because reporters are now posting information without stopping and having time to verify it. In some cases, they're directly posting press releases, things they hear on the police scanner, 
um, reports they get through other sources, that raises real implications for our credibility. The uh, primacy right now seems to be on speed and immediacy, but as professional journalists, we really have to ask ourselves a lot of questions about our own brand, what we do to keep people trusting that brand while we meet this challenge of speed and immediacy. One option to think about is how you use sourcing and transparency. So if you are posting something immediately and you haven't had a chance as a reporter to call and verify it, then I think at the very least you really have to be clear with the public where it came from. I'll give you my favorite quick example. I was in a grocery store um, about two years ago when the woman next to me started to scream. And then she got on the phone and she was sobbing and screaming that Michael Jackson was dead. <laughs> Next thing you know, the entire grocery store is yelling across the aisles and people are sobbing and screaming about Michael Jackson and they're all on their smartphones trying to figure out what's going on. I buy my groceries, I go to the car and I turn on my radio to my trusted source of news which is National Public Radio. I hear nothing about Michael Jackson. I switch channels to an AM channel and all it is is talk about Michael Jackson. So I found myself um, having a little experiment. I kept going back and forth and I was waiting for National Public Radio to weigh in. Because as the reports came through, it was clear that this KMIZ or whatever it's called, this funky um, celebrity uh, news organization that pays for, for news, had reported this first, had scooped the, na scooped the world. But everybody else was jumping on, including uh, the LA Times. About 30 minutes after this woman first screamed in the grocery store, National Public Radio broke into its programming and said, we feel compelled to report that there are widespread, uh, widespread reports from several organizations that Michael Jackson is dead. National Public Radio has not been able to confirm this independently. We are working to do so. We will get back to you as soon as we can but we felt it important to tell you that this is what's being talked about. Now I talked to people at NPR after that and they said it was a huge debate internally whether that was the right thing to do because National Public Radio has a standard that they said they never report unless they verify. And in this case, they pushed it further, but I think what they did was, that was smart was they let me know it was being talked about, which means they weren't keeping themselves from the conversation huge lesson for us in the mainstream press is we can't stay out of the conversation. If the public's there on Twitter, we got to figure out a way to be there with them. And NPR said very clearly, we can't independently tell you this is true. We will get back to you as soon as we do. I thought it was a very smart thing for them to do, but it was very uncomfortable internally. We're going to talk about each of these separately because these are the issues with 24-7 News Online. Um, Murder trials, I said, are um, being reported uh, constantly on Twitter now, especially in places where you can't get cameras in the classroom or cameras in the courtroom. And um, this has been a dramatic change. Four years ago was the case of the first, uh, one of the first live Twitter reportings, and it was the funeral of a four-year-old boy who had been killed when a guy ran through a, an ice cream shop with his car, lost control of his car. And people were very angry about that. Now this seems to have become standard operating procedure. You have to learn how to do this well. We talked about the Seattle Times. We don't need to go back into that. Accuracy, um, this is a huge issue. You're going to have to determine if you make a mistake in a first a release online, how do you correct that mistake? Because once it's out there, there's, there's something called a digital footprint. Once something is out there, it's out there forever. So you have to have a strong, firm policy and ethic about how you're going to chase corrections and how clear you're going to be about them, which is also a change. Um, we talked about accuracy and sourcing. If you haven't followed the New York Times coverage of the WikiLeaks from the Iraq War, I would encourage that you do so. Some people think these are the new Pentagon Papers. What's uncomfortable about it is that the New York Times source the guy who, from WikiLeaks, who, who dumped the documents is very questionable and the New York Times doesn't know where he originally got the documents. So they're in a position to have to decide, we believe the public needs this information, but they literally don't know the origin and whether or not the core primary source has an agenda or not. Very, very tricky ground for journalists. 
go on. This is, this is from the, and f finally, anonymous comments. This has been one of the most troubling things in the news industry. Once we opened up um, the ends of stories for comments from the public and we let them post comments without using their name, we realized that we were getting vicious, nasty, racist, hateful comments from people that are very, very disturbing. There are some reporters now who are refusing to write certain stories because they don't want the people in those stories to be subjected to these comments. Um, some people say you can't go backwards, you can't close the door on this, but there's now a growing movement that says we are going to end up having to moderate or close some anonymous comments or, in my opinion, make people attach their name to their comments or at least make it possible for us to know who they are because this has just gotten out of control. Going on. Okay, and the last thing is changing journalism. New partners, David Boardman talked about that in the Seattle Times thing where we're now working with blogs and citizen startups to help us with our journalism. We're letting the public help us with, um, with open crowdsourcing journalism. We're getting funding from people in ways we never did. Nonprofits and individual subscriptions and donations helping us pay for our news. I think in Seattle alone now, there are 43 neighborhood microblogs, news blogs that have risen up. They're usually small, one or two person operations. People make very little money at it. It's micro local news. Two years ago, the mainstream press ignored these people or disdained them. Now they're all linking to each other's world because they realize that the only way to get adequate information out to the public is to do it together, not apart. Dramatic change in philosophy. You don't have to go through these. It's just I would. These are three of the most um, watched microblogs in the U.S. right now: WestSeattle.com, Voices of San Diego, and MinPost. Um, and they're really good examples if you want to see how people are doing this. Of very, very local blogs. None of them, with the exception of West Seattle blog, um, WestSeattle.com, has learned yet if they're going to have a sustainable business model. And WestSeattle.com works because a husband and wife team basically work 24 hours a day putting this out. This is West Seattle blog. It's very local, very folksy, very homey, not much hard news. They do cover hard news when they get it, but they have access to a community that now the Seattle Times is plugging into using their sources and getting information back to them. Voice of San Diego is trying to do a little more traditional news via its blog. It's, it's it, um, hiring... It's covering city government in a very aggressive way, but it also has a different business model because it's also reaching out in a marketing way that newspapers never used to. And um, MinPost is all about public affairs and politics in Minnesota, and it rose up specifically because it felt the local newspapers weren't doing the job very well anymore. They're being funded through both subscriptions and um, nonprofits, so they're getting big grants from nonprofits. They don't know if they can sustain it. Here's what's going on in journalism. As newspapers contract, there's been a long, strong startup among these micro-local blogs and among uh, people who are doing investigative journalism. Those are the two places people are paying attention to. Storytelling, features, news features, the kind of work that I did for a long time, uh, not exclusively, but it was sort of my, um, my most, uh, the most fun stuff I did. Papers aren't supporting that kind of work as much anymore. So we're seeing a shift and a change in what people are covering or are willing to protect at core. Um, these are all examples of investigative startups. ProPublica is the biggest, um, and they partner and try to fill in the blanks of investigative journalism because people in the United States are very fearful that that's going to go away. We can move through that fairly quickly. Um, we talked about partnerships just last week. Google announced that it was giving $2 million or $5 million in grants to the Knight Foundation, which is another nonprofit, and the Knight Foundation funds journalism. So Google, private organization, you know, taking over the world, is now giving money to nonprofits to try to do journalism projects. You've got to stop and ask yourself, who owns the message here? Because our ownership is changing so dramatically. Um, and this one, this is the last one I want to mention, and then, then we're uh, close to done. Spot.us is a site based out of California that's trying to go national in which they literally ask people from the public 
to register and suggest stories or pay for stories and donate for, to stories they want to see covered. So let's say you want a story done in your community about clean water. You can go on, spot us, and say, hey, would you write a story about clean water and I'll give you five bucks if you do so. And Spot Us gathers up money from people, and once it has $3,000 or whatever, it goes finds a reporter to do the story. <laughs> Whole different way of thinking. And this guy, David Cohn, he's at Missouri this year on a fellowship, is getting an enormous amount of attention for this model of doing journalism that's paid for and inspired by public interest. Um, okay, what does this mean for you? You've got to think about your employment, who you work for. In the United States, more and more journalists are going to be contract or freelance journalists instead of working for the big shop the way I did. That means they've got to ask themselves where their financial and legal support is going to come from. When I got sued, my boss paid for the lawyers. If you get sued and you're a freelancer, where does that leave you? And as we talked about with the Google thing, what about special interests owning journalism? There is an increasing um, creep in sports journalism in the United States and within universities, nonprofits, hospitals, organizations like that, to hire their own journalists. And if you go on their websites, they'll literally, literally have a place that says news, and they are skipping past traditional independent reporters and claiming that they're doing their own inside journalism. It's really big in the sports world. So students of mine are now having to decide if they feel because they want and need the job covering sports, they're going to have to go work for Major League Baseball instead of for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Raises questions again about who controls the message. Um, you're going to need expanded skills. You have to be fast, but you can't just be fast because anybody can get information out on the internet in a heartbeat. You've got to bring something special to the table. You've got to have skills in multimedia storytelling that I never did. And you also have to have some depth and range that takes you past the moment of that's just about speed and pumping it out there. Um, your roles are going to change. A lot of news organizations are now holding public events uh, in which they're having people come together and discuss things. So they're becoming conveners. They're aggregators as much as they are originators of news now. And they've got to find a way to have those different relationships with the public so the public is invited into the reporting, and yet the paper can say, we've vetted this information. Okay, 10 quick tips for you. Know and honor your core journalistic principles because these changes are happening so fast, it's easy to get overwhelmed with them and forget what journalism is about at core, which means you really need to understand where journalism came from and what it's about. Know your local industry and laws. Know what laws are governing fair use, for instance. Can you pull up a YouTube thing and use it? Um, we're seeing a lot more cases of plagiarism because so many people just copy, cut, and paste from the internet. Know the laws of your organization, your local community, your country, and make sure you understand how the laws are attaching to new media. Learn basic web skills. The more you know your way around a website, the more you can be in control of your own work and your own destiny, especially if you want your own blog. Learn basic computer-assisted reporting skills. I don't think any student should go through journalism school without knowing basic computer-assisted reporting. And learn the fundamentals of digital. You're not going to become a master at all of these things, but at least have some knowledge or some um, ability to say, okay, I know, I know basically how editing audio and editing video works. And make sure you know how to do that stuff on your smartphone and your computer because you never know when an organization is going to say, we need audio on this story. Okay, last one. Um, find colleagues as partners. In my day, the lone wolf journalist was honored. Now you've got to work in partnership. So if what you're really good at is reporting and interviewing and writing the story, you find yourself a videographer you can partner with, and next thing you know, you're working as a team. Teamwork in journalism is everything these days. We're no longer doing that one story. You, we're putting together packages. You have to have a team. Specialize in hot topics. Pay attention to where you think the news is going business, the economy, finance, health, the environment, science, anything that can give you a specialty edge. Um, keep a blog, build your brand, be careful with it, be appropriate with it. But everybody says, I don't have a website and I get hammered for it. 92 of you are going to ask me by the end of the week, oh, what's your website? And I'm going to be sitting here saying, sorry, I don't have one, um, which is stupid. Um, watch industry trends, as I said, and then be very, very vigilant about uh, transparency, accuracy, sourcing, ethics. Don't let that stuff slide too much. One last point. 
despite all of this change, you got to keep your eyes on it. It's really important you do what you're passionate about and what you believe in. So no matter what happens, you figure out what kind of journalist you want to be, where your voice is, what you want to cover, how you want to cover it, because that's where you're going to really make a difference. If you chase the job and you chase the trends, but you're not doing what you care about or passionate about, not going to work. Okay, we've got 10 minutes for questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bendesinski. I'm sure all of you find here her presentation highly fascinating and stimulating. What she has done is that uh, 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 sort of explain how technology has changed the way journalism is uh, conducted. Now, before we move on to the second speaker, I, uh, you have about seven minutes for questions, right? Now, would anyone want to ask a question? No? How can you be journalist, right? <laughs> or, okay, question. problem of public and, and private uh, mm -hmm. information because I, I'm teaching at the university actually and then I I, I always read uh, my students, former students Facebook call and then some of them work in the TV station or newspaper and then they were always telling people on the Facebook call saying that okay I hate the guy that I just interviewed mm -hmm. and then he's lying all the way but and then later and then I watch the TV news and then okay he or she need to you know, report what he right. told to the public. And then I, I, sometimes I find it's so strange and I feel uncomfortable. And then we talk with the students and can you do that? And then you have a public identity right. and then you are anchoring the news, but right. you are telling all your friends uh, or yeah. just some public through the channel that you don't trust that person. And then right. I just feel that's a problem, but uh, we don't have this dialogue now. And then it seems that we we're just not sensitive to that issue. And, and then I, I would like yeah. to know your comments. I, I think that. part of what we're running into, because this happens all the time, and, and it always baffles me that you know my students will be putting something on their Facebook site about some party they had where they got like stinking drunk, and then they expect an employer to hire them and take them seriously. The first thing employers do these days is go and look at your social media sites. So they're watching how you're presenting yourself, and you have to pay attention to that. Um, what we're seeing right now in the U.S. Is, is news organizations are just now trying to figure out what their guidelines and policies should be about posting and what they can ask their employees to do and not do. And it's fairly controversial. I think especially among the younger generation that seems to have, because of social media, less of a sense of privacy boundaries than certainly my generation did. So part of it is we just got to pay attention to society is changing and evolving. But if I were running a news organization, I would have a very, very clear conversation with my employees about what professionally is appropriate, including on their private sites. And if they violated that, they'd be out the door in about two seconds. I wouldn't tolerate it. it, it there's just no way you can have that kind of commentary online in one place and then expect your journalism to be credible in another. You can't. So you have to come up with policies. And the young people who are doing this need to be part of defining and creating those policies so they understand them. Okay, second question. Yes. Good morning, Professor Chaker. Uh, I'm a student of Journalism and Public Communication of University of Macau, and nice to meet you here. My question is, uh, you mentioned about the emergence of new media and the social network. Um, so what do you think about the influence of the new media to the traditional mass media? Uh, okay, more precisely, uh, do you think it enhances the function mm -hmm. Uh, of the traditional media or the job of the journalist uh, in the traditional media, or det 